you're fired. That's what Israel just told UNRWA. The Israeli Foreign Ministry has informed the United Nations in writing that it is ending its cooperation with UNRWA. Israel has every right to do this. In 1967, after the Six-Day War, Israel and UNRWA exchanged letters. Israel said it would cooperate with UNRWA, and it did cooperate with UNRWA for nearly 60 years. But Israel clearly said in its letter that it is a provisional agreement which will remain in force until replaced or canceled. It has now been canceled. Despite the UN in UNRWA's name, UNRWA is a Palestinian organization. It has been infiltrated and compromised by Hamas. The United Nations refused to do anything about it. That's why the Israeli parliament voted to sever Israel's ties with UNRWA. What happens now? The UNRWA ban takes effect in three months. Israel is eager to work with other international aid agencies, including UN agencies that aren't compromised by Hamas. UNRWA needs to move out, and real aid organizations need to move in. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments. I do read them. Right now, tons of Hamas terrorists are making a final stand in northern Gaza. Israel is in the middle of a major military operation in northern Gaza to fight these Hamas terrorists. Israel will not allow Hamas terrorists to regroup and rearm so that they can carry out more massacres. The IDF has killed around 900 Hamas terrorists during its operation in the northern Gaza city of Jabalia. The IDF has also detained around 300 Hamas terrorists in Jabalia. These are guys who took part in the October 7th massacre. Whether they invaded Israel, or played a logistical or communications role behind the front lines, or they fired rockets, or they attacked Israeli soldiers in Gaza, or they were so impressed by the October 7th massacre that they decided to join Hamas. They're bad guys. These are terrorists who need to be removed from the battlefield one way or another. It's not easy. Israeli soldiers in Gaza are risking their lives in this battle, and there have been many Israeli casualties. Hamas terrorists continue to fight in northern Gaza from densely populated residential areas. Hamas terrorists continue to fight from hospitals. Hamas is using hospitals as military bases. Hamas terrorists who want to hide from Israeli forces, they run into hospitals. The reason they run into hospitals is because they know that the IDF does not want to enter hospitals. Last week, Hamas terrorists barricaded themselves inside the Kamal Adwan Hospital in Jabalia. The IDF entered the hospital and apprehended about 100 Hamas terrorists, including some who attempted to blend in with civilians who were trying to safely evacuate. Hamas puts everyone in danger. Here's a story from yesterday. Yesterday, the IDF helped coordinate the evacuation of patients and staff from the Kamal Adwan and Al Auda hospitals in a convoy to other hospitals in northern Gaza. The convoy also provided humanitarian aid to these hospitals, including food, water, fuel, and medical equipment to maintain their essential operations. Israel wants the hospitals to be able to treat patients. As the aid convoy passed by the Kamal Adwan hospital, terrorists detonated a bomb only a few hundred meters away from the hospital. As a result of the explosion, the convoy was hit by shrapnel. Nobody in the convoy was injured, but six children in the hospital were injured by the blast. The roof and the courtyard of the hospital were damaged. Hospitals are supposed to be protected sites. Hamas abuses these protections and turns hospitals into terror bases. Throughout the war, Hamas terrorists have used hospitals as military bases. They held hostages in hospitals. They met to plan attacks in hospitals. They stored weapons in hospitals. It's crazy. Does anyone think that terrorists should be able to hide in hospitals? Terrorists don't get immunity just because they go inside hospitals. The organizations that should be saying something about Hamas's war crimes, the World Health Organization, Doctors Without Borders, the Red Cross, are silent. Why? Journalists should know better. The Associated Press just published an investigation claiming that Israel is attacking Gaza's hospitals. The AP said the October 7th war has seen hospitals targeted with an intensity and overtness rarely seen in modern warfare, and that Israel has stood out 
by carrying out an open campaign on hospitals. This is reporting that is completely detached from reality. The evidence that Hamas uses hospitals for military purposes is extensive and cannot be denied. Let's never forget the big picture. Hamas is a savage and barbaric terrorist army that committed some of the greatest crimes in humanity, some of the greatest crimes against humanity in the history of humanity. Hamas continues to hold 101 Israeli hostages in its underground terror dungeons. Hamas has no red lines, and that includes using hospitals in its war to destroy Israel. Hamas, Israel is going to keep fighting Hamas until Hamas's military and government capabilities are destroyed and until every hostage is home. If you forget this big picture, then nothing else is going to make sense. Let's take some questions now from our audience watching live across social media. Our first question comes from Instagram Live. Uh, what's, the Israel's, what's Israel's plan for returning residents of northern Israel to their homes? It's been over a year since 60,000 people had to flee their homes. Yes, the Israeli Prime Minister addressed this question recently. He traveled to northern Israel and he said, with or without an agreement, the key to restoring the calm and security in the north, the key to returning our residents in the north safely to their homes, is first to push Hezbollah beyond the Litani. That's the river in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah needs to go north of it. And the prime minister said, second is to strike at any Hezbollah attempt to rearm itself. And third is to respond vigorously to any action against us. So simply put, he said, enforcement, 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 and cutting off Hezbollah's pipeline from Iran through Syria. So again, let's recap. 60,000 Israelis in northern Israel were forced to flee their homes a year ago because Hezbollah was firing anti-tank missiles at their homes and was firing rockets at their homes and continues to send these things and suicide drones into all of northern Israel. So 60,000 Israelis who were living in northern Israel had to relocate. They cannot go back home until Hezbollah is not on the other side of the border a short distance away, pointing anti-tank missiles at their homes, ready to invade Israel, ready to carry out another October 7th massacre. So Israel would like to see a diplomatic solution that will end the war in Lebanon with Hezbollah far from the border and not coming back and the Lebanese army taking Hezbollah's place in southern Lebanon. But if this doesn't happen, if there is no diplomatic solution that disarms Hezbollah and pushes it farther away, then Israel's military operation will continue and Israel will keep pushing Hezbollah away. We have seen in uh, many media outlets that Iran is saying that it's going to fire ballistic missiles at Israel. What's Israel's plan with regard to this? Yes, it's a bit crazy that this is the new normal. Iran fired ballistic missiles at Israel in April, over 100. It fired around 200 ballistic missiles at Israel in October. And it's saying that it's going to fire more ballistic missiles at Israel. So the people of Israel right now are sitting and waiting, wondering what's going to happen if Iran fires ballistic missiles at Israel. Are they going to hit our cities? Are hundreds of people going to be killed? We don't know. But what we do know is that recently Israel carried out a military operation in Iran that destroyed some of Iran's air defenses. So I would ask the Iranian regime exactly what are you thinking, what is your plan, why are you trying to do this, knowing that Israel is capable of responding with great force inside Iran and that Iranian defenses are not in place like they once were. So it doesn't make sense that Iran would be doing this, except if you understand what the Iranian regime is about. It's very clear that the Iranian regime wants to destroy Israel. It sees an opportunity to pressure Israel. It sees an opportunity to attack Israel. It's been sponsoring Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis in Yemen and militias in Iraq and so on. But to give a short answer to the question, I'm sure that if Iran makes the mistake of firing more ballistic missiles at Israel, especially more than it did in the past, that the response from Israel, again, is going to be more severe than it was recently. The next question is in regard to UNRWA. Like you just mentioned, Israel has cut off ties with UNRWA. What's Israel's plan for humanitarian aid in Gaza if Israel can't work with UNRWA? 
So first of all, the new law takes effect in 90 days from the moment it was passed, and that was a number of days ago. So we're saying just under three months will the law take effect. Until that moment, Israeli officials are allowed to cooperate with UNRWA, but after the three-month period is up, a new plan will have to be in place. And it's not just a question for Israel, for the Israeli government. It's a question for the entire so-called international community that wants to see additional deliveries of humanitarian aid to Gaza. The right response to the banning of UNRWA were, is to say it's great that it finally happened because UNRWA was horrible and it was doing a horrible job. Israel was sending massive amounts of humanitarian aid into Gaza. UNRWA was supposed to pick up the aid and deliver it. But massive amounts of Israeli aid would sit on the other side of the Israeli border crossing because UNRWA didn't have the capability or the ability to go and pick it up and deliver it. So what needs to happen, and it's obvious to anyone with half a brain, is that there are other international aid organizations that function all over the world in conflict zones, dealing with people in need during wartime. This includes the UN High Commission on Refugees, UNHCR. It includes USAID. There are many organizations that can organize the massive transfer of humanitarian aid from points in Israel to points in Gaza. I think a three-month time period is enough for these other organizations and other governments to get the message that they need to come up with a plan, work with Israel to make it happen, and a better future will be possible for everyone. And this is a last question that's come from various uh, platforms. Uh, what resources do you use when you're preparing the daily briefing? I like that. So the question is, where in effect do I get my news and information so that I can relay it to you? Obviously, I don't just make it up. I have to be doing extensive research before I appear on a live broadcast. So there's a number of things that I do, which is first, I read all of the press releases, tweets, statements, comments from different Israeli government agencies. This includes the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Israel Defense Forces, COGAT, which is the branch of the IDF that's dealing with humanitarian aid. So first, I'm reading all of the statements that they put out and trying to find out, is there something that didn't get enough attention? Is there something that I should be talking about in the daily briefing? So that's step number one, is to read the official press releases of different Israeli government uh, agencies and, and departments um, and individuals associated with them, whether it's the minister or a mid-level official or an ambassador or something like that. I am also reading Israeli newspapers. I'm skimming both in English and in Hebrew to make sure there's something I didn't miss. Uh, and I'm also reading the commentary from various journalists and other people on social media. I follow a diverse group of people, journalists, commentators, analysts uh, in Israel, around the world, in the Middle East, in the US. So when I'm skimming my Twitter feed, I'm getting a diverse array of perspectives. And all of these things help me create this product that we call the Daily Briefing. So it's official government press releases, it's solid news reporting, and it's reading commentary from others and putting them all together so we can present something to you in a few minutes of your time. So thank you for that question. And thank you for listening to the live daily briefing of the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. We are live every weekday, Sunday to Thursday in Israel at 3 p.m. Israel time, 8 a.m. on the East Coast. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I'm Daniel Rubenstein, and I wish you a lovely day.